Do you believe time traveling exists? Here we have another case of a quote unquote time traveler trying to prove it's real. He has a photo of a future city from the year 6000. Let's check it out. A man claiming to be a time traveler has posted a video online in which he reveals what life is like in the year 6000. The man, whose face is blurred, claims to have been part of a top secret government program and has brought back a picture of an unnamed city to prove it. He claims that humans live in peace under the benevolent rule of an AI overlord and that the technology of the future will allow people to shrink down. Let me get this correct, right? They believe that we could travel into the future but not in the past? Somebody break that down for me. How do, how do we have the ability to do one but not the other? And if y'all say, well, he just kind of explained it, still went over my head. So I need somebody to break it even further down to me. If I was a person in that audience, I still have my hand up. Can you break it down a little bit more? You know what I mean? <laughs> but on a serious note, though, yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that. We've seen videos and talked about that and discussions about how the speed causes time, even in relation to space. You know what I mean? How fast you go can possibly slow down time in a sense. So it's all about the person who's in the whatever spacecraft that's moving, trying to see what they look like after traveling at certain speeds because everything else is moving slower. I get that part, but... I don't know. I guess I'm still confused as to why we can't put some, why we can put somebody possibly uh, in the future, but not in the past. The sat watch it. Okay. I get it now. I, I get that now in relation to the speed of everything. I get that now. Okay. Well, I guess that's why also they say when uh, the astronauts went into space and they came back for their little quarantine, little incubation period where they had to sit quarantine for however long and then they studied their body and their bodies had changed i guess that's a test to them traveling pretty much into the future it changed them so i, I guess i can understand it from that standpoint. 28 three men set off to search a stretch of coast in scotland they were looking for a very special arrangement of rocks which would reveal that earth was far older than anybody thought what they discovered would transform science, challenge long-held beliefs, and as one eminent scientist later put it, would burst the boundaries of time. My name's Richard Fisher, and over the past few years, I've been researching and writing about what it takes to embrace a longer-term view. It's why I was drawn to the story of James Hutton, the father of geology. In the 18th century, Hutton and two companions scoured Scotland's east coast in search of a unique formation of rocks with gigantic timescales visibly written into their layers. I decided to retrace Hutton's steps to the place he found, called Sicker Point. But also maybe there are ways to you know, learn from nature to build cities that are better for all living things. I was joined by Edinburgh University's David Farrier, an expert on deep time and author of the book Footprints. On our hike, I would learn why Sicker Point is one of the best places in the world to understand the deep geological past. But to my surprise, I would also discover a coastline that harbours signatures of the deep future too. So we're looking out over Cove Harbour, where I think James Hutton may have left. And then uh, we've got Tornest nuclear power station in the distance. It's quite a contrast. In the late 1700s, James Hutton, a farmer and keen geologist, noticed something curious about the rocks near his home. It was simply impossible for them to have formed if the biblical account of time was true. And the remarkable thing about Hutton is, I think, he arrived at an understanding of eternity through evidence, through what he could point to, particularly on his farm, um, he was able to get the first gleanings of the processes that form mountains and valleys that move continents. And uh, of course, it was you know these first inklings that then led him to look at rock formations and, and try to um, connect what he saw on his farm to what he saw in places like Sicker Point. 
And see, people have been questioning things since the beginning of time. How do how you think we've made it as far as we have and progressed as far as we have without us questioning things that were told to us about the past? He questioned biblical things. That's why I don't get mad. And I often tell people you can't get mad at people for questioning things or having their own opinions if they don't line up with yours. We've been doing that, and that's allowed us to progress over the years. So I, I ain't mad at that at all. <clears throat> what he saw in his farm to what he saw in places like Sicker Point. Hutton had spotted an arrangement of rocks called an unconformity, a line separating two radically different rock formations, and within which tens of millions of years of time had passed. In 1788, he took two other researchers, John Playfair and James Hall, to show them what he had found. By, by this point, I think Hutton had already established many of his theories, but he, he was setting out to actually show people, to take yeah. people out, out into the, the landscape and say, like, look, look at these rocks here. This, this, yeah. this makes my point. Seem eager to get there, David, you're rocketing ahead. Oh, is that? No, yeah, I'm just okay. thinking about my picnic. Yeah. <laughs> You can you can just see it right in the You're staring into the abyss here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Are we going down? So David, we made it uh, after a two three hour walk and uh, a very steep uh, slope, clinging to a rope. Yeah. We are finally here at one of the most, if not the most important location for geologists, uh, Sika Point. It's an extraordinarily charismatic place. I mean you. you... You look at it and you know that if you walk down there, you can put your finger on the gap where you know, 60 million years or so pass that, you know, without mm. any trace being recorded, you know, where the two rock formations meet. And it's an astonishing thought. And, and there's definitely that sense of the sublime there of something that overwhelms and far exceeds you know, the human scale. So how did Hutton know that his unconformity was special? He realised that there's only one way this particular arrangement of rocks could exist. More than 400 million years ago, the region was covered by an ancient ocean. In these waters, alternating layers of mudstone and grey wacky were laid down. Over time, these rocks were then buried, squished and folded into vertical layers. That's the lower part of the formation. Then there was an epic pause. Tens of millions of years passed when little happened apart from slow, steady erosion. Eventually, around 370 million years ago, after the ocean had long gone, the environment was far drier. It was only then that the red sandstone of the upper layers began to be laid down. The line that separated these two rock types, that's Hutton's own conformity. That, that 65 million year gap where it's not recorded, it's just gone. Like all, all the creatures and, and all the processes, you know, the, the many times around the sun, all, all that happened and that's not recorded in the rocks. It's a huge, huge gap. What's that? It's not recorded. It doesn't line up. It doesn't match up with things they were telling us is basically what he's saying. So maybe we need to look more into that. Again, inside some of these caves that may have once been underwater may answer questions and, and point back to dates and time that just don't line up. And we can get our, our answers from that. So, again, this all goes back to questions of time. Time and how things line up, which could possibly lead to answers into time travel. What I love about geology is that every rock tells a story. A story a about an ancient story. environment and process. A quiet ocean punctuated by sudden surges of sediment. A desert with dry sand grains blown along by the wind. A tropical rainforest chock full of verdant life. But what the unconformity represents is an absence. There is no environment or process to describe here. However, there is a story, and it was a story that would change humanity's place in time. 
Hutton's discovery would prove to be more than a geological oddity. Bef it says in the late 1700s, it was generally believed that the Earth was around 6,000 years old, which is interesting from the beginning of the video where the dude is allegedly showing the picture of a future city from the year 6,000. <laughs> Before the 18th century, the biblical account of time was dominant. By one Christian calculation, the Earth was only a few thousand years old. Hutton transforms that view. It wasn't an easy idea to swallow, was it? No, it was, it was radically challenging. Um, to, to the, some of the fundamentals of how many people would have viewed the world. All of human history is just scratching the surface of um, our planetary history. Writing about the visit to Sicker Point afterwards, Playfair wrote, The mind seemed to grow giddy by looking so far back into the abyss of time. In Hutton's words, time had no vestige of a beginning and no prospect of an end. And although Hutton didn't give a full account of the processes that he, he had an insight into, um, he opened the door. Darwin would not have been able to formulate his theory of natural s selection without the affordance of, of deep time that, that Hutton allowed. I went with my friend and neighbour Dave Milligan, he lives just five minutes up the road actually, across the football park. So the piece is that it's part spoken word and part, um, part song. And it sort of imagines James Hutton and um, James Hall and John Playfair going out in their boat to see, uh, to see the point and that, that moment of epiphany. The three men find no trace of a beginning, no prospect of an end. Only one thing is sure, everything dissolves and disappears. Tears and diatoms, walls and bones and oceans, the earth is never still, it's never still. And this one line, even rocks melt in the sun. And that's a reference to Robert Burns because one of his best loved songs is um, My Love's Like a Red, Red Rose. How's it go? Till all the seas gang dry, my dear, and the rocks melt away the sun. Oh, I will love thee still, my dear, till the sands of time have run. And it's just like a little B part for one of the verses for My Love is Like a Red Red Rose, but almost certainly um, linked to the fact that he was aware of what Hutton was developing at, at the time. If he was still alive, what would Hutton have to say about deep time today? Well, if he returned to Sicker Point, he may well remark on the striking changes to the coastline. There's a, there's a viewpoint that you get, um, and you can see North Berwick Law which is an old volcanic plug. You can see the cement works at Dunbar, you can see Torness Nuclear Power Station and you can see the Bass Rock out in the Firth of Forth, all from essentially from where Sicker Point is. And there's something about that that horizon line that I just find really is such a massive story because you've got a clear sense of the deep time geology of it all. It's like really palpable, the two most obvious landmarks in that flat landscape. And then these two massive human-made um, points of industry that are have such consequences for, you know, like a vast number of generations. There are also signatures of our troubled present and long-term future. A carbon-intensive cement works and a power station producing nuclear waste that will stay radioactive for thousands of years. Farrier calls it an Anthropocene coast. Striking to, to think that, you know, the world we inhabit has not always been the same, that there have been many different versions that's worn many different guises, which, you know, inevitably makes me at least think about the world to come, the one we're making um, through climate change. Like by 2030, 2040, there's gonna be more concrete on Earth than all, all the fish, trees, uh, all, all the human beings, if you added up and all put them on the scales. Humans. Yeah, yeah, which I yeah. think is a extraordinary statistic, isn't it? It is extraordinary and, and sobering, I think. And all of the cement that we've produced in, in the past and spread over the landscape creates another kind of unconformity. You know, so many, you know, just, you know, human generations, but species have not, you know, left any trace in, you know, in the book of the earth, but 
we've begun to write our names in the densest, most durable ink in this book. Um, and I think that's what sets us apart in our relationship with deep time, is that we are a part of it in a way that no